I was wondering what picture Jim was going to pick. I, I see, I, I, I was wondering, it's like, how demonic is he going to get with the picture? He fooled me. He didn't go demonic at all. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, I like that, that picture. Um, I want to start off this morning by telling you one of my favorite stories in the Bible, in the New Testament. And we're not going to turn over there directly, but uh, it occurs in Mark, the uh, Gospel of Mark, starting in chapter 4, at the end of chapter 4. And you're probably more than a little familiar with this story. We've talked about it before. Um, you're probably familiar um, with it, for those of you who were raised in the church, grew up going to Sunday school class. And I've, I've, I've used this before, and I used to use it more often than, than I have recently. But how many of you remember flannel board? Flannel board? Okay, flannel board is, um, uh, I, was, I remember flannel board quite well, where they would have a typical generic scene and they would have those little flannel cutouts that you would stick to it, and then you would, you would show the kids. Um, Jesus is always doing this. Have you noticed that? Like, does he have a ligament problem in his elbows, and he can't, he can't drop his hands below this, this angle? Um, Peter's always <laughs> like that. Um, but this is a very famous flannel board story. Um, but I love the that's what originally, where I originally heard this. But... More than the flannel board, I, I love this story because it is possibly the story of the, of the second longest night in the apostles' lives. Now, obviously, the longest night in the apostles' lives is the night of the crucifixion. I think we can all agree with that. But the second one, the one that, that really threw them for a big emotional loop, occurs here starting in Mark chapter 4. Jesus has just finished preaching, and he is... Uh, the crowd keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but we, this is a, a, a time before microphones, before uh, voice projection. So crowds don't grow, in Jesus' day, crowds wouldn't grow from the back out. You know, like you go to a concert, like a standing, uh, an outdoor concert, you just stack from the back and it keeps getting longer from the back, right? Well, that's not what you would do in Jesus' day, because if you were further back, you couldn't hear so they grow from the front. They grow longer going that way, not that way. So the, the teacher is the one that has to keep moving back because the crowd's getting bigger and people are crowding into here. And finally, this crowd that he's preaching to gets so big, he's on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, it gets so big that eventually he has to get into a boat <laughs> because people are crowding the shores. He gets into a boat and they set it on the water and he's standing from the boat preaching to them. And he preaches all day to them which I'm going to do now. No, I'm kidding. There's a, there's a little joke. My, my dad, um, when he turned 50, um, we were, he was preaching in California, and uh, he had always said for years that one of his greatest, one of his dreams as a preacher was to, do, was to be like Paul and preach till midnight. You remember that story about Eutychus where he pre Paul preached till midnight and he, he kills that poor kid because he preaches so long? Uh, but then he raises him from the dead, so it's okay. But no, the... The, uh, but my dad always had said several times leading up to his 50th birthday, I want to preach till midnight like Paul did. I want to preach till midnight like Paul did. Until finally, the Sunday before his 50th birthday, one of the elders who got up to dismiss the congregation got up and said, tonight we're, going, we're giving Stan Williams his birthday present. The elders have talked. We're giving him his birthday present. We're going to let him preach till midnight tonight. Services will begin at 11.30. Uh, <laughs> the... But the, the, this, he's preaching all day. And until finally, you know, I think some of you don't really know this if you've never been involved in preaching. We have enough, we have enough preachers and former preachers here in the crowd to, to reiterate this. Preaching can suck it out of you. It can, it can tire you out. Uh, any of, maybe if you have not been a preacher, but you have been a, a, uh, a teacher or, or a lecturer of some kind, um, talking all day can be exhausting. It can be. You can, it can leave you emotionally drained because your mind is moving and you're, you're just laying it all out in the field. Well, Jesus has been preaching all day and he's exhausted. And when he finally finishes, when night starts to fall, he says, instead of getting back on, you can't blame him, instead of getting back on the shore and having to navigate all the people that want to ask him questions and touch him and like, get in, it's like, hey, can you uh, kiss my baby? And he's like, yeah, they don't want, he doesn't want any of that. So what he does is he says to the 12, we're already in the boat with him, Let's just set across to the other side and we'll just go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Well, Jesus is exhausted. What do you do when you're exhausted? 
you sleep. So he goes to the back of the ship and he falls asleep. Well, the Sea of Galilee brews up this really big storm. You know what story this is now? Okay. Brews up a really big storm. And it's real bad. And it's so bad that these lifelong fishermen, which most of the apostles are, are terrified that they're all going to drown. Think deadliest catch level waves and things like that. And it's, it's scary. And I love Peter. <laughs> it doesn't say it's Peter, but it has to be. <laughs> Come on, this is the only something Peter would say. But they, Jesus is still sound asleep in the back of the boat. And they're going to drown. And they're freaking out and they're bailing. So they go wake up Jesus. And I've often heard some teachers make it sound like they know that Jesus can calm the storm. They know that he could save them. He could do something. I don't think that's why they wake Jesus up. I think they wake Jesus up so that he can could, he could man his own bucket. <laughs> To get, to get the water out of the boat um, because of the way they wake him up. Do you think, you think Peter goes up to Jesus and goes, Jesus, wake up. Excuse me, Lord. Lord! No, no, what? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Remember what, you, what, what they say to him? They basically say, wake up! <laughs> they, they say, do you care that we will drown? And then Jesus... You, Raise your hand if you've ever been woken suddenly and it made you angry. I was woken suddenly one, one morning, and I not only was woken sudden, suddenly, so I was angry about that, I, I, my socks, I, I put my socks on and they were slippery, and I, and I kind of fell down the last four steps at the bottom. I was not a pleasant man to be around that morning. But Jesus is not a pleasant person to be around in this particular instance, because he wakes up and goes, What? And he stands up and they say, we're, we're drowning, we're going to die. And he says, oh, ye of little faith. And he doesn't, say, he doesn't say that all piously. Oh, ye of little faith. He says it like Vader says it. You know, I'm thinking about Vader because we just did Star Wars. I find your lack of faith disturbing. You know, like that. Like very, very angry. He's like, <laughs> stupid people. We're not going to die. And he goes up to the front of the boat and he says three words. What are they? Peace be still, which is Shakespearean English for, hey, shut up. <laughs> That's what he says. He gets the, he re, it says. The text says that he rebukes the wind and the waves. Does he say, peace, be it thou still? Is that what he says? No, he, he, he shouts it. He screams it. He's, a, he's not just angry at the apostles. He's angry at the weather. You ever been angry at the weather? Okay. He's angry at the weather. And he shouts to it and he says, hey, calm down. And everything just stops. Now, storms typically peter out, right? They, they kind of lose their steam and then it kind of slowly stops. I've seen it just kind of stop raining immediately before, but it's pretty rare. But not only does it just immediately stop, but the clouds immediately dissipate. The water goes immediately calm. It's, I mean, this is obviously supernatural. And, then, and he... And he he turns and says, oh, you have little faith. And he goes, he goes uh, back to sleep <laughs> in the back of the boat and kind of goes, excuse me. And they part immediately and he goes through them. But then I love the statement that Mark 4 ends with. It says, and when they saw this, they were terrified. Who are they terrified of? Jesus. Because then they say, who is this that the winds and the waves obey him? But that's not the end of the night. The night keeps going. That's the beginning of the night. That's how the night starts. You see, then they land. Mark 5 starts with them landing on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And they land in the region of the Gerasenes. Now, the Gerasenes is a, is a region of, of uh, a Gentile uh, community. And that would immediately make them uncomfortable. Because they don't enjoy being in Gentile communities because... First century Jewish people don't like Gentiles. They just, they just don't. They're pretty racist like that. And several of the apostles we know struggled with that opinion. So they get there and they're immediately uncomfortable with that. They land at night. It's already pitch black. But then not only do they land in an in a uncomfortable foreign country, not only do they land in the middle of the night, but guess where they land? In a graveyard. A spooky Halloween level graveyard. And they get out there and they're getting out of the boat and they're getting ready to go you know, pitch a tent or whatever they're going to go into town to find some shelter. And they go in there and then they hear a cry, a mad cry come from among the tombs. 
Like, ah! Oh! And then you can just see Luke go, ah! Or you see Mark go, ah! <laughs> and they're going back and forth. What was that? Then they see somebody top the hill and charge towards them. And this individual <clears throat> is naked. Yes, naked. He's got shackles like Marley, you know, for those of you who understand that reference, hanging from him. He's bleeding all over his body because he's a cutter. He cuts himself with stones. And he's rushing and charging them. He looks insane. Think Grizzly Adams on PCP. That's basically what he looks like, okay? And, and, he's, and he's running down the hill, and they're freaking out. No, what's going to happen? But then this guy sees Jesus. Now, we know who this is. He's a demon-possessed man named, and we're only given one name, Legion. But he sees Jesus, and he does the most peculiar thing. He spots Jesus. He rushes up to him. He hits his knees. And he says, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, I beg you, do not torment me. The guy that they were just afraid of a second ago is terrified of Jesus. Now, what would that make you feel about Jesus? You were in the boat with the guy. And then, we know the rest of the story, he, can't, uh, he has, uh, he has uh, a bunch of demons in him, <laughs> more than one. And he's been cutting himself. He, every time the people in the town tried to chain, that's why he has chains on him. Every time he would, they would try to chain him up to keep him from hurting himself, he, would just, he was strong enough to break the chains and torment himself some more. Well, Jesus finally casts him out. And remember what he cast him out into? Pigs. Now, this is how we know this is a Gentile country because they're keeping pigs and a, and a Jewish country wouldn't do that. But there's this guy. Now, it was very common for, for, for herdsmen of any kind to stay with their animals all night to keep them from being stolen. So there's a guy out there sleeping with the, with, near the pigs, and the pigs are out there just kind of snoring it up and grazing. And it's the middle of the night, and then all of a sudden the, ki- the, the pigs freak out. Now, it's 2,000 pigs, and they freak out, and what do the pigs do? He wakes up to see them do what? They charge, they head for the nearest cliff, and like lemmings into the sea, jump into it. Now, would you tell anybody if that happened? Now, this is an era before social media, so you can't tweet it. Would you go into town and tell your buddies? They're just sitting there, and they just lost it. And they just, they just ran into the ocean. <laughs> or they just, ran, they just ran into the sea. It's not the ocean, it's the Sea of Galilee. But they, they jump in the water, and they all drown. So he tells everybody. He wakes everybody up. And the town gets together, and they come to the, to the graveyard, and there they see Jesus standing with this legion guy sitting at his feet, now in his right mind. And he's like, you know, playing canasta with them now, or something. And he's, he's completely normal now. And you know what the people do? You know how the people respond, how the people respond to this? They go up to Jesus, and they beg him to leave the region. <laughs> Why? Because they're scared of him. Long night, right? I have preached more sermons on that section than you can tell for how I told the story. I have preached more sermons on that section than I care to admit. But I want to focus on something specific. What happened when Legion saw Jesus? Now, now Legion is possessed with what? Demons, okay? Fallen angels. Servants of Satan. Evil incarnate, right? 2,000 of these bad boys. He's got inside of one body. Now, that, that's, a, uh, <clears throat> that's a party no one wants to go to, <laughs> okay? This guy's head's a bag of cats, right? But he sees Jesus, and what does he do? What do the demons do when they see Jesus? They bow. They say that he's the Son of God, and they beg him not to torment them. Let me ask you something. Did the demons believe that Jesus was who he said he was? Hmm. That's an interesting thought. The demons believe that Jesus is who he says he is. It reminds me of something else, actually, in John 4. John 4 records the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. 
you know, where Satan comes directly and tem- and to directly tempt Jesus. Now, I guarantee you, it's more than three times because Jesus was in, was in the wilderness for 40 days. Only three instances are recorded of his temptation. But Satan has this dialogue with, with Jesus. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but have you noticed that, that Satan quotes Scripture to Jesus? He quotes from the book of Psalms. He quotes from the prophets when he's tempting Jesus. Did you know that Satan has read the Bible? Did you know that? Not only has he read the Bible, he memorized some stuff because it doesn't. He, John doesn't say he's flipping through. Hold on, let me get to the concordance. L, L, L. He doesn't do that. What does he do? He quotes it. He quotes it. This brings us to James' statement. Now we're going to have two sermons on James, this one and one tonight. But this statement by James is very important. We actually did a whole series on James, and I don't want to keep you know, kicking a dead horse, but there's a statement that you might have missed in our, la- our previous discussion about this book. Starting in chapter 2, verse 14, he says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone has faith, says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Now, we had a whole class this morning on how we're saved by faith, and it's true. Church, we are saved by faith. Paul says in Ephesians 2 that we are saved by grace through faith so that no man may boast. He says that there's nothing we can do because we're dead in our trespasses and sins. We're not dying in our sins without Jesus. We're dead in our sins. You know, a person who's dying from smoke inhalation in a burning building can try to get to an open window. Now, they might fail, but they can try. They can still accomplish something. But a person who's already dead in the hallway of a burning building... There's nothing they can do to avoid the flames. We are not dying in our sins, folks, without Jesus. We are already dead. And we are saved by faith. But James raises an interesting point here. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Okay, so what do we know immediately? We know immediately that we're talking about salvation, right? We're talking about the process by which we are saved from our sins and spend eternity in heaven with God. Okay, it's very important. Verse 15, or... If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be fit, warm, and filled, without without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Do you guys remember the movie The Dream Team with Michael Keaton? you ever see that movie? It's pretty obscure. It's a, it's a movie about a group of, of mental patients who escape and they have a, a, a day on the town free. And, and they're all crazy. <laughs> well, one of them, uh, I, I can't remember, remember his name, but it's, it's the, the actor that played um, Raymond's dad and Everybody Loves Raymond. He was Frankenstein and Young Frankenstein, that guy. Yeah, yeah you, you'll, they'll tell me the name and I'll feel really bad about it later. But in the movie, he's in the movie, he thinks he's, he's, he's insane and he's convinced that he's Jesus. He believes himself to be Jesus. And there's one scene where they are walking down the hall. They're in a hospital, and they're trying to get to a certain place in the hospital, and they're all pretending to be doctors, so they all get lab coats. And they're walking down, and there's this guy on a gurney, and he's laying there on a gurney. It's the funniest part of the whole movie. And as this guy that thinks he's Jesus walks by him, and he, go, he, he passes by this very sick man, and he says, Rise and walk, my son. And then he keeps walking, and then you can see in the background, this guy go, Sit up, and go, and then he gets out of the gurney and he falls flat on his face. <laughs> I feel like that's the sentiment that James is, is, is saying here. If you meet someone who's hungry and you say to them, be filled with the Spirit, because the Beatitudes say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be what? Filled. If you go up to someone who is actually dying of hunger and say, be filled with the Spirit, are they going to thank you or curse you? Well, they're probably going to curse you, right? Especially if you have a sandwich on you, right? Or if you have money to pay for them to get food. He's saying that belief by itself can be more of a danger than a help. It can hurt more than it can cure. And he keeps going. But someone will say, verse 18, you have faith and I have works, as if they're separate things. As if there's no connection. 
And church, this is a discussion that we enter into theologically a lot about today. Because as Mike pointed out, there's a solid movement where, where we, we just say, it's called universalism, where we just say that we just have to believe, that just belief is good enough, just belief is good enough. And, and it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe it. He says, you have faith and I have works. He, then he says, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. He says, good luck proving you have faith if you don't have anything to list. Well, I believe it. Well, how do I know you believe what you're saying? Well, I just do. You just got to take my word for it. We know better than that, don't we? I've used this analogy a lot, but I, I think it's the perfect one. If, if I... If I tell Stephanie I love her, but then punch her in the face, does she have any reason to believe me? No. But it's amazing to me that there are women out there that do that. Where they say, well, I know he loves me, but he beats me. Well, he doesn't love you. Of course he doesn't love you. He wouldn't beat you if he loved you. We know this lesson. This is common sense. That you can't say you believe one thing and act like you don't believe it and expect people to believe you when you say it. Right? It's ridiculous. But then look at verse 19. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even demons believe. And shudder. You say you believe in God. You say, great, so does Satan. Verse 20. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and, that, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now it's important that he's not saying that we're not justified by faith. He's saying that we're not justified by faith in a vacuum. We're not justified by faith that exists by itself, just in this little corner of our mind, and it's just strict belief. Verse 25, in the same, And in the same way, also was not Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? And then ending with verse 26, For as the body is apart, apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Have you ever asked yourself why faith without works is dead? If I say I believe something, we just said this, if I say I believe something, but I act like I don't, do I believe it? Do I believe it? No. I'm reminded of the meatloaf song. I will do anything for love. But I won't do that. Right? Doesn't make any sense. It's ridiculous. And we see this, we see it romantically. We see it in marriages where, where we, we promise for life, but we don't really act that way. And then we're surprised when we hear about a couple getting a divorce. Shocking to me. We do, it, we do it economically at our jobs when we go to our boss and we say we're going to do something but we have really no intention of doing it. And then when we get called on the carpet, they say, well, I said I was going to do it. Yeah, but you didn't do it. Belief without action is not belief. You know what you call belief without action? There's a word for it. Belief without action is not belief. It's a theory. You know what a theory is? A theory is an idea that you have no empirical concrete proof for. You think that this is the way it is, but you don't know it. Belief without action is not belief. It's a theory. How many of you have run into somebody who lives deeply sinful, but says... They believe in God. And you don't have to raise your hand for that. Bob did. Everybody pointed Bob. Um, but just think about that for a second. They live a deeply immoral lifestyle, but they say they believe in God. 
Try this if you're close enough with them. You can't do this to a stranger because they'll punch you. <laughs> Ask them if they believe in God. Ask them if they believe in Jesus. You know, catch them doing something really immoral and saying, do you believe in God? And they say, sure I do. Respond to them by saying, great, so does Satan. He does too. I think we like to think that Satan is, is an atheist. He's not, folks. He's a theist. It's kind of hard to not believe in God when you've met him, right? Church, belief by itself does nothing. Because it's not belief. Not in the way that you want it to be. If you want it to be faith, if you want it to be something that saves you, you take that leap. Why do we call it a leap of faith? <laughs> it's called a leap of faith because you know you're going to land on the other side, right? Even though everyone else around you doubts, you know that you're going to land on the other side. That's why they call it a leap of faith. That's why the person takes the leap in the first place. If you didn't know, you wouldn't do it. It's amazing to me how many people live their lives saying they believe in God when they really only believe in God theoretically. Oh, sure, I believe that he's probably out there, but I'm not going to change the way I behave. I'm not going to change the way I act. I'm not going to act on this belief. I'm going to continue living the way I want to live and hope it comes out in the wash. That's, that's like just a, a couple of steps past agnosticism. That's, that's agnosticism plus, really, more than it's faith. But we know this lesson, folks. Belief that I don't act on does nothing for me. There's a song that you may or may not know. You probably know it. It's pretty popular, pretty well known. But I want you to imagine, before I read you these lyrics, I want, as we close, I want you to imagine a, the idea that it, it's putting forward. Stephanie's could probably finish the sentence. She's heard me say this so many times. Do you know what the purest form of love is? The, 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 the form of love that is, is the most pure most unadulterated, unrequited. Unrequited love is the most pure form of love. Loving someone powerfully that doesn't love you back. Think of all the musicals that have been written about that. Right? All the songs, all the pop hits that have been written about unrequited love. Well, this is one. I want you to imagine... A man who loves a woman from afar. And he loves her as fiercely as any husband loves a wife. It's not a physical love because they're not together. But it's just the strictly emotional romantic love. And he loves her with every fiber of his being. But he never gets anything back from her. Imagine the torture of that. Maybe you don't have to imagine it. Listen to these words. Though I've tried before to tell her of the feelings I have for her in my heart. Every time that I come near her, I just lose my nerve as I've done from the start. Do I have to tell the story of a thousand rainy days since we first met? It's a big enough umbrella, but it's always me that ends up getting wet. I resolve to call her up a thousand times a day and ask her if she'll marry me in some old-fashioned way. But my silent fears have gripped me long before I reach the phone, long before my tongue has tripped me, must I always be alone. Every little thing she does is magic. This sentiment is deeply theological, folks. Can you imagine loving God but not being loved back? Can you imagine that? 
That's a horrible thought, isn't it? Church, God doesn't have to imagine that. God knows exactly what unrequited love feels like. Think of all the people that he loves enough to die for that don't love him in, re- in return. But I want you to imagine this. We, we, read, we, we listen to that story, we, 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 we hear the words of that song, and we say, just tell her. You ever watched a romantic movie and he's like, just tell her, say it, now, kiss her, dummy. Like, you know, you're, where you're, you're, you're sprouting at the screen. We see that and we go, why, why can't he just do it? Church, I feel the same way when I see someone living their life full of sin yet proclaiming belief. Oh, I love God. Why don't you tell him? Why don't you act that way? It's as silly as saying, I love her with everything in me, but I'll never tell her. I'll never act on it. That love will not leave you fulfilled. It will leave you miserable. Satan believes in God and it profits him nothing. Demons believe in God. It profits them nothing. Don't just have belief, theoretically. Have a belief that leads to faith, that leads to action, that leads to eternal life. If that's what you want this morning, if you want more than a theory, if you want firm, real faith, whether you're a Christian this morning, willing to recommit to something you've forgotten, or you're not, and you want to take hold of a Savior that loves you enough to die, will you come?